This is the Ross Kaminsky Show. You're a great American. Now, Ross Kaminsky. Come on, man. On Denver's talk station, 630 K-How. All right, let's do it. Happy Wednesday. I'm Ross. Let's get right to it. I am so pleased to be joined for the first time on the show, and he's joining us by Zoom. So if you want to check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash 630K, you can see us. Dr. Marty McCary, uh, surgeon extraordinaire, professor as well at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, author of uh, the best-selling book, The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. Marty, good morning. Thanks for being here. You got any Whipples on the schedule today? <laughs> no Whipples today, Ross, but uh, good <laughs> to be with you. Yeah, thank you. My, my dad's a general surgeon, so uh, you and he can talk Whipple stories one day. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> uh, we got a lot to talk about, and you've you've kind of made a big name for yourself on, on Fox in recent months. Uh, being a kind of clear-eyed analyst of a lot of stuff that's going on. So I wanted to tell you I, I appreciate that. Thank um, you. Uh, and uh, I should also tell you I was, I was pre-med for a long time until I decided that you needed to have a certain desire to help people to be a doctor that I just <laughs> don't really have. So <laughs> both my parents are doctors, my sister, and on and on, and I'm going to leave this to you. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the variants to start. Um, we hear about this thing called Delta. It seems like mostly vaccinations works, work well against all the variants so far. How should we think about this stuff? Yeah, we've had hundreds of variants, Ross, and none of them have evaded the life-protecting uh, work of vaccines or natural <laughs> immunity. Uh, it's extremely rare for, for any of the variants to have caused what we call a breakthrough infection. We can feel good about the protection of vaccinated immunity and natural immunity with the variants. Now, if you're not vaccinated and you haven't had the infection in the past, you're more likely to pick up the Delta variant because it probably is a little more contagious. But it's not necessarily <clears throat> um, causing um, uh, worse disease that we know of for sure. And I think we have to be careful with uh, variant fear mongering because the reality is we're beating this pandemic. We're at very low levels. And regardless of the variant, the, the immunity works well. This whole thing, as I'm sure you've noticed, uh, th you know, throughout more than the past year, has gotten ridiculously political to the point where you can you can predict what somebody thinks the origin of the virus was or what somebody thinks about vaccines if you know whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Um, and one of the, I'd like you to address, a lot of my listeners, you know, somewhat right of center, and two big groups in the United States that still seem a little hesitant about getting the vaccine, uh, conservative Republicans and, and African Americans. There are probably two different marketing pitches to those two groups. Probably a more of the former listening this morning. What do you say to people right now who are thinking either I don't trust it because it hasn't been around long enough or I don't need it because so many other people are getting it and I'll just benefit from herd immunity? Well, Ross, I've been looking at a lot of numbers from vaccine trials, and here's where I'm at on it. I think that the vaccines are impeccably safe. And if you look at the track record of 300 million vaccines delivered, we have not developed a vaccine this safe probably ever in the history of medicine. Now, if you're under age 30, we are seeing a clustering of these heart inflammation complications that are often mild in younger folks after the second dose. And so for people under 30, I tell them, take do one dose because one dose is incredibly effective, especially with a younger, stronger immune system. And if you've had the infection in the past, you don't need a vaccine. There's no evidence to support that you need a vaccine on top of natural immunity. You certainly can do one dose. I sometimes recommend that. But natural immunity does contribute to population immunity. Hmm. Interesting. So, you know, I've got a wife and two kids. My younger kid was very enthusiastic about getting vaccinated. So he's done that already. He's had two shots. My older kid, who's going into tenth grade, is a little is a little scared, and I'm trying not to force this on anybody at, at this point, especially since the risk to kids seems fairly low. I'm trying to let it be his decision. I hadn't really thought about that one shot thing. Uh, my kid's worried about myocarditis, and also, and I think this isn't only you know only my kid. 
a lot of, you know, you, you said this is the safest vaccine we've developed in a long time. Uh, how, how do you know that a vaccine is very likely to be safe in the long run since it hasn't yep. even existed long enough for there yeah. to be a long run yet? Good point, Ross. Look, first of all, I should say uh, the first thing I like to say is we got to respect people who choose not to get the vaccine. We got to stop with the demonization. We don't need any more celebrities or politicians running commercials, urging people to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. If we want to increase the vaccine uptake, simply make it easily available at routine points of American life. If people can be told that they can stop for five minutes on their way out of the grocery store or other points where they normally are and they can become immunized to COVID, we'll see uh, increased adoption. Not everybody has a smartphone and can schedule an appointment online or can travel. Some have unpredictable schedules. That's how we address vaccine rollout. People who don't feel comfortable with the vaccine, I can certainly explain the science, but we need to respect their decision. We do not need to get every single American vaccinated as the politicians are saying. Natural immunity is a significant contribution to population immunity. And on the safety, in general, with any vaccine ever developed in medicine, the complications are clustered in the first few weeks. That is, if anything hmm. is gonna happen after the vaccine, if you're gonna develop any downside complication, you will see it in the first few weeks. That's true of every vaccine. Things don't pop up down the road a year later. So we can feel good about the safety profile that we know of so far. That's a great answer. Glad I asked you that question and you're the first person to answer it that way. It's very valuable. Um, my special guest for those just joining, Dr. Marty McCary. He's the chief of Islet Transplant Surgery and a professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about, or talk a little bit since we haven't talked about it yet today, the origin of the virus. And before we dig into what you think and why and what the odds are, why do you think or why should we think that figuring out the origin is important. Well, I think a lot of people are angry and they have a right to be angry, right? This is, if it were a liability case in court, this would be the biggest court case in the history of the world. This would be the biggest liability case in the history of liability. And it's very obvious to me exactly what happened. Now, let me, let me just preface what I'm gonna say by, we don't need more investigations. When you see politicians saying they support or demand a full investigation, that's nonsense. You're not going to get any more information than the information we already have. Any original virus samples from that lab have been denatured, incinerated, the ashes flushed down the toilet, and the septic tank thrown in the ocean. Okay, there's no, absolutely no more samples that we're going to somehow discover in the back of the refrigerator if we send a researcher back to the Wuhan lab. I said back in the spring of last year when the pandemic started, that an infected lab worker at the Wuhan Virology Institute was likely patient zero and presented to that local hospital. We know the doctors were detained. That's a fact. They've spoken about that. The police semi apologized for detaining them for so long. They were reprimanded. And I think it's hard to deny what was happening at, the, at that lab. It was clearly gain of function research on bat coronaviruses. It's a strange thing to me. I, I think... I, I wouldn't say that I know where the virus came from. Anyone who says they know is, is lying. I, what I thought has been weird about this whole thing, and again, part of this drifts into how this has been so political, is how many people said it couldn't have come from the lab when just yeah. based on logic the lab was always the most likely thing. And that doesn't mean it's 95% likely. It could have been 55-45 or 65-35, but it was always more than 50-50. And yet so many people yeah, said, I'll you're a tinfoil hat conspiracy theory nut if you're going to say it probably came from the lab. Well, that's the state of journalism in the United States. Journalism is mostly dead. You had the entire United States journalism communities drop what they were working on and focus on this one infection and every single person missed it. Every journalist glossed it over and they, because they had a bias and that bias, um, except for a few in individuals, um, they it allowed them to not do their job. And so it's a disappointing commentary on journalism 
uh, in the United States. But you know, all you have to do really is go to Google Maps, type in the Wuhan Central Hospital and the Wuhan Virology Institute, and you see they're about five miles apart. I mean, that is probably 50% of the evidence right there. And then you put the other pieces together, plus what's come out since, and you have a case beyond a reasonable doubt. You can't be 100%, but beyond a reasonable doubt, it's very clear what happened. Yeah, last thing on this, just because I think it frustrates me as much as it frustrates you. I don't know if you saw this thing that's made more news than it should have probably, but comedian Jon Stewart was on Stephen Colbert's show, and Jon Stewart basically said that he thinks it came from the lab. He, his first line was something like, uh, I appreciate science for helping us find a solution to this problem that was probably caused by science, right? And they went yeah. on like that for a little bit, and then and Stephen Colbert's reaction to Jon Stewart was, so how long have you been working for Senator Ron Johnson? A a as if Stephen yeah. Colbert yeah. has any better idea than Jon Stewart or anybody else. I'm sorry, I'm just frustrated. Hey, look, this is the politicalization that angers a lot of us in the medical community. I'm not a partisan. Um, I don't have any allegiance to any White House talking points like you see from our public health officials where they know kids wearing masks outside while they're distancing. They know that's BS, but they're afraid to upset their bosses in the White House so they don't say anything. They, they, that is the new scientific guidance that we have and it's cancel culture moved into science. I, you know, I told Dr. Fauci, Tony, he's had a bad week. He had a bad week last week, but I told him, um, you know, I really respect your work on HIV in the past, and I have a, a lot of respect for you, and I'm sure you have the best intentions. I believe you do. I've just disagreed with you on most of the strategies during the pandemic, and that's okay. That should be healthy. That's the open dialogue we used to have before this sort of cancel culture set into science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is slightly tangential, but a lot of my frustration with this has been how the the medical side has utterly seemed to dominate the brain space of of the politicians i'm not i don't really get mad at fauci even though like you i think he's been wrong a lot when the president whether it's this president or some governor does something that is overly restrictive and doesn't seem like the the right path and then you know where, where i get frustrated i get frustrated at the politician not the doctor the politician's job is to take in what the doctor says, but also to take in what the economist says and what the job provider says and what his own common sense says. And, and not just, you know, if you're a public health professional, then that's the lens you view the world through. And again, I, I'm not mad at those guys for getting it wrong. I'm mad at the politicians who, who didn't use their brains and didn't take in any other information. Look, I agree. I think Dr. Fauci is an opinion and we should have multiple opinions. I'm more upset at Meet the Press and CNN that would run only one medical opinion incessantly 12 hours a day for most of the pandemic as mm -hmm. if there were not multiple points of view. Let me give you an example. The FDA told doctors they have to throw away the extra half dose that's in the vial when you aspirate the vaccine. If they didn't have that ridiculous regulation that serves no purpose and no goal, but a bunch of bureaucrats insisted on it, we would have increased our vaccine supply by 15% when we started to roll it out. That would have saved a lot of lives. Wow. A bunch of us were crying bloody murder about it, and we did not hear any of that outrage from a lot of our public health officials. Wow. And, and then, of course, you had Facebook, right, deleting any post that suggested that it came from the lab. And again, I'm not trying to make a point about where it came from. My point is about Facebook. And then suddenly, oh, OK, you can talk about it again now that it now that Donald Trump isn't president anymore. Uh, you're allowed to talk about it again. It's, it, it's infuriating. Uh, one last question for you, Marty. Um, yeah. Kids and, and vaccines. Necessary, not necessary, just as safe as for adults. Well, look, we haven't had good data on the stratified risk for healthy kids versus a kid with a comorbid condition like obesity. If they have a comorbid condition, it's pretty clear to me those are the kids that are at risk of dying, and they're definitely at increased risk of that inflammatory syndrome that can be, can be painful. Uh, so vaccines are a clear yes in that group. One dose can be adequate, in my opinion, based on the current available data. And in healthy kids, the case is there, but it's not compelling. And so if somebody uh, chooses to get it, again, I would recommend one dose in that population. 
to reduce that risk of the pericarditis and myocarditis. Great. Absolutely love it. Dr. Marty McCary, uh, Chief of Violet Transplant Surgery and Professor of Surgery at Johns Hopkins, author of The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. Um, actually, I, I, I would be remiss. I would like to ask you to give me 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever you like on your book, which is not about COVID. It's actually about a much more important, much bigger issue. Well, we've got to start treating diabetes with cooking classes instead of just throwing insulin at people. And we've got to treat back pain with ice and physical therapy more often than just surgery and opioids. We've got to start talking about the environmental exposures that cause cancer, not just the chemo protocols to throw at people when they have cancer. Food is medicine, and this is the movement to address the underlying issues that bring people to care. That's the main theme of the book. And the second theme is that we need honest and fair prices in healthcare. The fundamental problem in healthcare with the cost crisis is we have non-competitive markets with no prices. So there's price gouging and predatory billing that is being cleaned up right now by a group of hospitals and doctors and entrepreneurs that are saying, we will give you an honest and fair price and our billing quality is a part of our medical quality. Hmm. Let me tell you a 15 second story, Marty, and I'll let you go. So. I had some medical stuff going on, including a lot of the stuff in the area that you work on. And I had a CT with contrast of abdomen and pelvis. My bill was $10,600. I called a local standalone imaging center and I gave them that code for the scan. I told them what it was and I gave them the code. How much for this? $500. Yeah. Then... This is the, I know you hear that story all the time, right? So then, the, you know, there's this law and the hospitals are supposed to post their pricing, right? So I, I found the spreadsheet and the spreadsheet says $2,600. And then I, you know, called the billing people and they said, well, we have a different spreadsheet. And I said, I don't care about your secret spreadsheet. This is the one you made public and you posted on your website, right? And if you don't, make my price that price, I will see you in court. So far, I haven't heard back from them. <laughs> well, so. um, that good to hear that story because I was involved in that executive order on price transparency to require hospitals to show real cash prices, not the artificial inflated prices. And eventually app makers and entrepreneurs are going to make that in an easy to navigate user interface where you can help um, navigate your care using price as well as quality. Oh, I sure hope you're right. And I think I do think it's inevitable. Everybody check out Dr. Marty McCary's new book just published a week ago, The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. Thank you for being here. Thanks for everything you've done throughout all of the COVID stuff. And congratulations on the new book. Thanks so much, Ross. Great to be with you. Likewise. Thanks. All right. Uh, boy, that was very, very interesting. That guy is so he's so clear, isn't he? Really appreciate that. All right, when we come back, something different, a very big setback for the Biden administration's radical anti-fossil fuel agenda, which does have real impact on Colorado, um, although I can't say the world is now safe for affordable energy. KHOW Denver, 630 KHOW. An iHeart Radio station. Available everywhere on our free iHeart Radio app. Number one for music, radio, and podcasts, all in one.